Hello, this is Daniel Raymond, the voice behind Ray's Guide, and today I would like to talk about Lagrange points. And they are named after a French-Italian astronomer, so the intent is obviously that they are pronounced Lagrange points. But that may not stop folks like Ray. Get used to it! Hab, 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 Lagrange, where the dust and the asteroids stay, where fast is the food and refining is good, and the skies are all cloudy and gray. Anyhow, I'm a science nut. This year my son gave me a gift subscription to Masterclass, and my initial selections on my watch list included Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye. Anyhow, for a science nut, the fact that they respected the science enough to work with Lagrange points rather than just put stuff where it looked good or wherever, counts as something. Now, to take the next step when they design more stations is to start to represent the unique personalities of these Lagrange points. Because an L1 point is different than an L2 point and an L4 or L5 point. Now, some may say rule of cool, but it is cool that things are different. No matter how cool the current Lagrange environments are, they're all the same and that makes them less cool than they can be, particularly for us science nuts who find the differences interesting. So let's start with what is a Lagrange point and then why do they exist where they do and then we can talk about what gives the one a personality different than the other four. In a two-body system, such as a sun and a planet, a Lagrange point is a point where the gravity of the two bodies create a location where something there would have the same orbital period, the same quantity of time in a year, as the smaller body. They aren't actually tied together with any sort of invisible rope. They are just orbiting at the same rate, which isn't the same thing as the same speed. The L1 point, being closer to the star, is traveling in a smaller circle and thus slower than the planet in order to finish the year in the same time. Similarly, the L2 point, being further out, travels in a larger circle and thus must be traveling faster than the planet to complete the orbit in the same time. So let's start with the L1 point. The L1 point is directly in line between the center of the planet and the center of the star not sort of directly between them, but on an absolute straight line. So as much as it might be difficult to make it out, when being at the planet and looking towards the L1 point, you are looking directly at the center of the star. At the L1 point, the gravity of the planet is directly opposite the pull of the star, meaning that the net gravity is less. Less gravity is slower orbit, and at just the right spot, the slower orbit is just enough to have the point keep pace with the planet and still have the same year length, despite traveling in a smaller circle. But that's why the point must be directly in line. If it was even slightly out of line, then the gravity of the planet wouldn't just be countering the star, but also pulling it along or pulling it back. Which brings up a feature of not just the L1 point, but of the first three, and that is that all unstable. That means that they are like balancing a marble on top of a basketball. Yes, there is one point where the marble balances in theory, but as soon as even the slightest thing acts on it, then it will start to roll off, at first slowly and then rapidly. And there is always something else acting at that point. Solar winds, tiny gravity pulls from other planets being bumped into, and so forth. So while it is very easy to keep something at an L1 to L3 point, it is not automatic. And moreover, nothing collects or stays there naturally. So honestly, the generic points that Star Citizen is now using overestimate the debris at points 1 through 3 and underestimate it at 4 and 5. Not that there wouldn't be anything at points 1 through 3, but they would be man-made in origin, inert materials, and, and materials lost in inefficient processing at the refineries, and other forms of waste. Humans do tend to be sloppy beasts. What's David in mind for your next move? Well, if they follow standard imperial procedure, they'll dump their garbage before they go to light speed, and then we just float away. Get the rest of the garbage. Then what? But this does mean that the debris will tend to be in streams, spiraling out from the station itself, which could be rather attractive, too. Moving to the L2 point, it, too, is a place where the star, the planet, and the point are in completely straight line, so that the gravity of the planet is exactly added to the gravity of the star, resulting in a larger net gravity. Higher net gravity means faster orbital speed, so that is why the L2 point has the same orbital period as the planet, even though traveling along a longer distance in a year. 
So when you're at the L2 and you're looking to travel directly to the L1 point, you can't because the planet is in the way. And CIG gets this exactly right. Try to navigate between L1 and L2 and you must travel to the planet, around it, and then continue. Kudos for getting it right. But it also means that if you're at the L2 point and looking towards the planet or the L1 point, you are also looking directly at the star. Not kind of sort of looking towards the star, but directly at it. But the star at an L2 point would not look like this. It would look like this. Now, the exact degree of eclipse would depend on the relative sizes and distances of the star, planet, and Lagrange point. But at an L2 point, the planet would always be a big black dot in the middle of the sun. Kind of cool, no? Now, on to Lagrange point 3. This, too, is in a straight line between the planet and the sun. So, L1, L2, L3, the planet, and the star are all precisely collinear all the time. This means that you can't fly directly from the L3 point to any of the others because the star is in the way. And sure enough, you can't. More kudos, but we really need to get these things actually moving like planets. Because all the scientific verisimilitude we get from using things like the Grange points, we're losing by having the planet stuck in non-existent amber. That brings us to Lagrange points 4 and 5, which are, in fact, the ones discovered by Lagrange. The first three points were described earlier by another astronomer named Euler, so I guess you could call them Euler points if you wanted to make a point. You see, technically every point along the same orbit of the planet would have the same orbital period of the, as the planet, except the planet's own gravity pulls them faster or slower, and they would fall into a different orbit. But something makes the L4 and L5 points stable instead. And that something isn't gravity. It's the Coriolis force, which isn't actually a force, but like centrifugal force, a product of inertia when things move in a circle. In the case of Lagrange points 4 and 5, the Coriolis force counters the push or pull of gravity of the planet and creates a stable equilibrium. And by stable, I mean that if the L1 through L3 points are like balancing a marble on top of a basketball, the L4 and L5 points are like balancing the marble at the bottom of a round bowl. Which is to say, you don't have to expend any energy to keep it there, and the things floating by will metaphorically roll down into it and stay. These, by convention, are called Trojan asteroids, because the first ones found around Jupiter were named after characters from the Iliad. Now, the size and strength of the L4 and L5 Lagrange points are related to the gravity of the planet. Jupiter's Trojan asteroid clusters are huge, rivaling the entire asteroid belt in the number of massive asteroids they have. However, only two Earth Trojans are large enough to have been seen by telescopes. That doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of smaller rocks and dust like what we currently see in the verse. It also may well be that Earth's Trojan asteroid fields are so small because there is such huge competition from the gas giants in our solar system. So, having gone over their astrophysical differences, what would be the differences between each of the Lagrange point stations and their role in gameplay of the living, breathing universe? Because the Lagrange points are one tiny specific point, it's impossible to keep something exactly at it. So man-made objects actually circle around the Lagrange point in what's called a Lysergis orbit. In the example of Hurston's L2 station, you can see that it's just a little over 8 kilometers out. Starting with L1, this point is both relatively nearby to the planet and in constant sunlight, with little to no atmosphere to cut down on solar radiation. That means it would be a highly effective place for solar energy generation. And that also makes them very effective places for energy-intensive industries, like refineries. Spot on there. But when I look at our current L1 points, I see the refinery, but not the big solar panels that would be powering them. And as I mentioned earlier, the clouds would be more like trails of debris spiraling out from the station itself. In addition, if the land mass of the planet were inhospitable for agriculture, the L1 point, thanks to endless sunshine, would be the choice for space-based agriculture. Next, the L2 point, which, thanks to the perpetual state of eclipse, would most decidedly be the worst place for solar energy, energy-intensive industries, and agriculture. So it would most likely be a smaller station focused on being a waypoint for travel further out from the star. But also one other thing, science. The constant state of eclipse makes it a better place to put a space-based observatory and other experiments requiring extreme cold. For example, Earth's L2 point is the destination of the James Webb Space Telescope, which is traveling there right now. So the L2 points might be university research centers. 
Then the L3 point, which won't feel very connected to the planet as they are far, far away from it and can't even see it directly or communicate directly with it. But from a security standpoint, every planet has a blind spot. It can't see through the sun. So if you wanted a place to see and intercept somebody that might be hiding behind the star from you, or even worse, trying a sneak attack from direction, then the L3 point is the perfect spot. So I suggest that the L3 spots be remote security points, sort of like NORAD stations in space. But there would be something more at L3 stations, and that would be a huge boom-bust cycle in the local businesses. My understanding is that the star-to-star jump points in the game will exist outside the planetary zone near the Oort cloud, and that being massless, they won't orbit the sun. So a place like Microtech L3, as it orbits Stanton, will go from being the first place stop when arriving and the last point stop when leaving, a major boom point, to having, to having no reason to exist other than as a security basis, bus times. This, in fact, is the main reason why we need that, that planetary motion going. It can be the thing that makes the dynamic economy dynamic, as particular routes become shorter or longer. And finally, the L4 and L5 points, which are perhaps the most interesting. First of all, they should have more and bigger asteroids, particularly if they are part of a system with a planet with a high gravity, like a gas giant. Crusader, by the way, is a gas dwarf, not giant. Big L4 and L5 points will have the kind of asteroids that you would need to bring in Orion for. And for an efficiency point, it certainly makes sense for them to have refineries close by too. But there is another important use for the stability of the L4 and L5 points. Let's say you're an insurance company who has just paid a claim on a ship and are now the proud owner of a shipwreck. One of your first worries will be making sure that it will never fall on some sort of occupied place because, you know, liability. Hmm, where could you tow it so that it would stay there forever and never cause a problem? Oh, I know, the L4 and L5 points. So expect that when towing comes to the game, one of the main towing contracts will be for bringing derelicts to the L4 and L5 points, and that there will be major centers for salvage and reclamation operations. So the L4 and L5 point stations will be the place to buy scrap cheap and to buy reclaimed and refurbished ship components and repair materials. Between mining and salvage operations, the L4 and L5 points should be major industrial zones. And there's another reason for that, too. The L1 through L3 points will need to have regular positioning thrust to stay in place, so the stations will need to be designed to handle those. The L4 and L5 locations, however, being stable, don't need repositioning thrust and thus can grow to any size or complexity desired. So by following the science and engineering, the next pass can be even more interesting and cool. It's one of the things I tend to keep in mind that you don't have to be wildly imaginative in creating a space game because science has already done the wildly and imaginative part for you. And now I'm going to grow the channel ship giveaway. As of recording, we are at 43% of the subscriber goal and 24% of the membership goal to release to one lucky person their choice of the Anvil Liberator, the ship shipping ship for shipping your ships, or the massive MISC Odyssey long duration exploration carrier. One entry per video, members are entered automatically, and if the winner is a member, as of the day of the winning video was published, they get both the Liberator and the Odyssey. For everyone else, just be a subscriber and comment using the secret word. And the secret word for this video is the thing that has Earth's L2 point in the news right now. Fly safe, keep it real, and I'll see you in the verse. This is Daniel Raymond for Ray's Guide.